In this video, we explore Sri Lanka's capital, Colombo, and tell the story of the island's early history and the magnificent hydraulic civilization of Anuradhapura. Now, let's start the story. You have these islands like stepping stones that have meant that Sri Lanka and southern India have always formed a shared cultural space. At current sea levels, it's still only 40 kilometers at its narrowest point. There were indigenous people here, who are now called the Vedas, then the Sinhalese came around 2,500 years ago. Buddhism arrives not long after the Sinhalese do, and spread quickly. However, it adapted and assimilated a lot of the pre-Buddhist traditions. The pre-Buddhist religion probably looked a lot like we would now call Hindu. Hinduism or Brahmanism, and still Sinhalese Buddhism includes worshipping a lot of different gods and spirits, with the Buddha as the central but not only character. One of Sri Lanka's holiest places is the tooth relic up in the hill country of Kandy. Thousands took part in the procession to the temple, in which is enshrined a tooth believed by the faithful to be a relic of Buddha himself. It all illustrates the enduring appeal of a religion founded about 500 years before the Christian era. The Sinhalese bhikkhus maintained contact with distant centers of Buddhism like Nepal and Tibet and also provided a link with Southeast Asia. And this is the thing about Sri Lanka's early history. It was a connected place. Dangling on the bottom of India, it is in a magnificent spot for sea trade on the trade routes between the Middle East and therefore Europe and Southeast Asia and China. There were colonies of Greeks and Persians living on the island and later Arab traders. They traded gems, pearls, cinnamon and elephants. By the 13th century, Century, Buddhism had disappeared from India, stamped out by the aggressive Hinduism of the Dravidian states, leaving Sri Lanka as a lonely outpost of the religion, which would later shape how Sri Lankan Buddhists would see themselves. These settled Sinhalese cultures would always be based around water, because you need water to grow food, and only some parts of Sri Lanka had enough of it for agriculture throughout the year. That was until the rise of an empire of technocrats and the city of Anuradhapura. For well over a thousand years, the history of Sri Lanka was the history of Anuradhapura. Soon after the Sinhalese arrived, they built this city, and the kingdom lasted for around 1500 years. Can you imagine being a part of a civilization like that? It must have felt eternal. At its height, Anuradhapura was one of the great cities of its age. It had dozens of monasteries and as many as 10,000 monks. This was the golden age of Sinhalese culture. Its temples and dagobas were the biggest things that people had built since the pyramids of Giza. At its height, it would have taken a day to walk across and had a population of as many as 2 million people. And it traded with places as far away as Rome. The thing was, Anuradhapura was built in the island's dry zone. The city was only made possible by one of the world's most sophisticated systems of irrigation, which turned these dry plains into a rice bowl. Water would be kept in artificial lakes or tanks until it was needed, then released in a system of canals and sluice gates to distant lands. For example, you had the Jayaganga Canal, which was 90 kilometers long, but had a gradient of just about six inches per mile. It irrigated 466 square kilometers of agricultural land. We actually don't even know much about how they did this. We don't know how they did their calculations or what equipment they used. And what they achieved would still be a major undertaking today. The land was flat, but it had these natural basins that were basically imperceptible to the naked eye. And these ancient engineers found them and turned them into tanks, of which there were more than 18,000, each one on average 350 times larger than an Olympic swimming pool. They were the ultimate hydraulic civilization. They changed the entire ecosystem of the dry zone. Until the hydraulic civilizations, Sri Lanka didn't actually have that many elephants. But now, in the words of John Gimlet, mankind had turned the land into a giant elephant salad and their numbers skyrocketed. Most importantly, Two rice crops could now be grown each year, as well as extra vegetables, and the lands could support a much higher population. 
the Sinhalese kings turned this extra wealth into building works like these. Some of the Sinhalese kings tried to control the entire island, though this was mainly aspirational. No sustainable control of the entire island was ever achieved. However, by its nature, a hydraulic civilization is also fragile. Its maintenance requires complex administration. During this time, the biggest threat to Anuradhapura were the South Indian kingdoms, the great Tamil dynasties of the Cholas, the Pandyas, and the Pallavas. When, in 933, the Cholas invaded Sri Lanka, it brought down the Anuradhapura civilization. In fact, the Chola's power extended all the way south to the Maldives and across the Indian Ocean to Malaysia and Indonesia. The capital was moved from Anuradhapura to Polonnaruwa. Arguably it was now that a distinct Sinhalese identity began to emerge, as different from the Tamils. Of course, the elites of both continued to intermarry. Princes and princesses from South India would come over to the island and marry the Sinhalese princes and princesses. So it was never purely oppositional. Also, while the kingdoms were Sinhalese, Tamil mercenaries were regularly brought over to fight for them. As time went on, the Tamil mercenaries became vital components in the armies of the Sinhalese kings. I don't know how easy it is to tell, but this thing is really, really big. However, with the collapse of the irrigation system, the Sinhalese hydraulic civilization would decline and be reclaimed by the jungle and be forgotten. It was only rediscovered by the British in the 1820s, although a small number of pilgrims did continue to visit the sites. The island would return to a state of warring kingdoms and principalities. The Sinhalese would retreat to the south and the center of the island, while in the north, the Jaffna Tamil kingdom dominated. In between was the Vani dry zone, this area that had once supported these magnificent hydraulic civilizations was now malaria infested and dry once again, inhabited by a small number of chieftaincies with low population densities. The Sinhalese and the Tamils would be kept separate by this Vani dry zone, this gigantic scrubby hedge which crossed the island for the next five centuries. <laughs> At the centre of Anuradhapura stands this bow tree. It was planted here in 288 BC, 23 centuries ago, apparently from a clipping from the very same bow tree under which the Buddha was enlightened at the other end of the subcontinent in northern India. It was brought here and planted and still grows, long after the original one has been destroyed. This tree is probably the oldest human planted tree in the world. As you can see, Buddhists still come to it to make offerings. I met a man outside who offered to be my guide. He showed me around some more ruins, and then we biked around the artificial lake, or tank, just like the ones that were built here a thousand years ago. I had one more day in Colombo before I headed south. The first stop was the Natural History Museum, a dark and forbidding place, which I had completely to myself. I then came across a graveyard, which was really quite nice, and was sprinkled with slightly strange quotes by a truly random collection of famous people.
After some rice and curry, I found myself in a park, a wonderfully quiet spot almost exclusively frequented by young couples. I got the sense there weren't many other spaces in Colombo where young people could be intimate and alone. Always, of course, under the watchful eye of the authorities, with a flashlight for the dark corners. A gardener showed me the tree of bats and then asked me for some money. I went to the train station to try and buy an onward ticket out of Colombo, but all the ticket sellers were on strike. With inflation soaring, the government had not raised their pay. It meant everyone would ride for free, if you could get a space. Near the train station, I found this guy giving commentary while his partner sells lottery tickets. Peta, near the train station, is where Colombo does business. You can get almost anything here. The guy who took it upon himself to show me around Peta told me there are only two knife sharpeners left in Colombo. This guy and his son. In central Colombo there are Buddhist and Hindu temples, Christian churches and Muslim mosques, all right next to each other. Often Buddhist and Hindu shrines exist along the same alleyway. Unlike the rest of Sri Lanka, Colombo is almost a third Tamil and a quarter Muslim. A short walk from Peta is the bus station. When I tried to explore the rest of Fort, I was stopped. Without knowing it, I was heading towards the president's house. The security presence was palpable. If I had turned up a few days later, I think I would have gotten in. The most defining image of the Sri Lankan crisis yet. Thousands of angry citizens laying siege to the residence of their president, Gotabaya Rajapaksha. Protesters breached the security of the presidential palace and ransacked the property. Back at the park, the couples have been joined by families.
it's difficult to say exactly how much of the real full Colombo experience I got just because of the fuel shortage. I don't know how much activity has slowed down. There's definitely a lot of police and military that's really noticeable. Just person after person has come up to me and completely unprompted gone out of their way to tell, tell me how much they hate the government, how much they blame the government for what is going on, how much they, they wish the, the president would resign, what a bad president that they think he is. In the park, the bats were starting their evening, going out in search of mangoes and bananas. stands a statue of a Tamil who used to work as Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Sri Lankan government. For his services, in 2005 he was assassinated by a Tamil militant. After the fall of Anuradhapura, the island would return to a state of warring Singhalese and Tamil kingdoms until around 500 years ago, when there arrived some new players in the game. The Europeans had arrived, and Asia would never be the same again. Mm -hmm. 